Shit, shit. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Amy Thompson. I'm um, from the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath, and I'm also one of the um, co-directors of ActNow Film. So thank you so much for coming to the premiere of ActNow Film, Youth Climate Leaders in Conversation with Climate Experts. The film, which has been almost a year in the making, is a powerful testament to the critical contributions of young people um, in our efforts to tackle the climate crisis. Bringing together 30 pairs of youth climate leaders and eminent climate experts from 33 countries and six continents, it serves as a clarion call for the greater integration of young people in the negotiations and decision-making processes that will determine our planet's future. When we first conceived the concept for this film, we could not have imagined the responses we received. We were amazed when 342 people from 88 countries replied to be part of the film. 30 of the incredible youth climate leaders are featured in the final film. All of them, in different ways, are at the forefront of advocating for change as activists, entrepreneurs, early career researchers, community organizers, writers, storytellers, UN youth ambassadors, and delegates. We've been equally blown away by the enthusiasm and support this project has received from the climate experts we invited to participate. Among the many eminent voices that feature in the film are Mary Robinson, Chair of the Elders, who we are delighted to have with us here today. World-renowned climate scientists, Professor, Professor Catherine Hayhoe and Professor Johan Rockström, Indigenous leaders, Hindu Ibrahim and Dr. Myrna K. cunningham Kane, former UNFCCC Executive Secretaries, Christiana Figueres and Patricia Espinosa, Sir Alex Sharma, President of COP26, and Dr. Fatih Birol, Direct Executive Director of the International Energy Author Agency, to name just a few. We were also honored to have the opportunity to film with the late Professor Salim Al-Khuk, who's director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, who sadly passed away in October this year. Professor Huck was a giant in his field and a tireless champion for climate justice, passionately advocating for those most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We hope that this film can make a small contribution to amplifying his work and legacy. At Now Film is a project that is very close to my heart, Initially conceived in the run-up to COP26, it is now running in its third year. As with previous films, it was important to us that this year's film authentically reflects the voices of all participants. Therefore, none of the conversations that form the basis of the film is scripted. This unconventional approach to filmmaking meant that we could only start fleshing out the narrative and key messages after collecting the footage. We are very grateful to Octopus Films who managed to condense over 16 hours of raw footage into a compelling 30-minute film. Listening to all the conversations that we captured was a very moving and thought-provoking experience for the project team. Many of the participants already see the devastating impacts climate change has on their countries and communities. They often express simultaneous feelings of frustration and hope. Frustration because the current pace of global climate action to reduce emissions and adapt to a changing climate is simply too slow. Hope because they see people around the world joining together to enact change. The message coming out of this film is loud and clear. Young people from right around the world are capable, ready and committed to be part of the urgent national and global climate debates and negotiations. As the film shows, young people already provide critical leadership on the climate crisis, 
but the avenues through which they can influence top-level decision-making on this issue are often limited. Now is the time to change this by creating official routes for young people to be an integral part of global climate negotiations and national climate policy design. This should also involve providing robust training and development opportunities for young people seeking to engage in climate advocacy, diplomacy or policy making. Ultimately, all young people should be equipped with the knowledge and skills they will need to navigate an increasingly uncertain future because it is their future that is at stake. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has made this project possible. First and foremost, we are extremely grateful to all the participants who took, part in, who took the time to share their personal experiences, perspectives, worries, and hopes for the future. We learned so much from these conversations, and together they constitute a powerful call for the integration of young people in climate decision-making. I would also like to thank our partners, the UK University's Climate Network and One Young World. A special mention should go to Matthew Coe, an emerging young composer who created the beautiful music featured in the film. Last but not least, I'd like to thank my wonderful At Now colleagues. It's been a pleasure working with you on this project. But back to today. We are delighted to be joined by several of our At Now film participants, both as part of the panel and in the audience. Thank you for coming. You're next here from Mary Robinson, who we are honored to have as a speaker at the, this premiere. Mary is a former president of Ireland Chair of the Elders and Adjunct Professor for Climate Justice at Trinity College Dublin. She has previously served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy in several capacities, including a Special Envoy for Climate Change. In each of these roles, she has shown visionary leadership and unwavering commitment to justice and equality. Mary is a strong advocate for urgent climate action, delivered in a just, inclusive and fair manner and through intergenerational dialogues. And as demonstrated recently, she is not afraid to speak truth to power. It's a great pleasure to welcome you, and uh, thank you so much. May I introduce Mary Robinson? Thank you very much, Amy. And actually, I was so pleased that you began with a warm tribute to Salim Huck, so well deserved, and he is much missed here by so many of his friends. It was a very untimely and sudden death, and we, we feel the loss. Thank you for having me uh, here with you as we officially launch this exciting collection of intergenerational conversations through the Act Now Film Youth Voices Film Project. I'm delighted to be here in my capacity as chair of the elders, as you heard, and that's a body that was brought together in 2007 by Nelson Mandela, and where um, a group of independent uh, leaders, um, really former leaders, uh, because we're out of office, out of our positions, but we work for peace, justice, human rights, and a sustainable planet. And when Nelson Mandela founded us in 2007, I was there at the very beginning, he issued a mandate for, the, for our work. And the mandate given to us as elders more than 16 years ago offers, I think, many powerful calls for action that are still critical today as we consider tackling the ex existential threat of the climate crisis. First, Madiba said that it is kindness and generous accommodation that are the catalysts for real change. And I want to bring these values to the fore as we begin our intergenerational discussions today. We need kindness and generous accommodation in the conversations we have with one another. If we're to stand any chance of turning the tide on the climate emergency, then we need all of us. We need all of our energy, all of our resources, and we need the wisdom and leadership of every generation. We need to create spaces and opportunities for honest conversations that are inclusive of all voices. And that's why I so welcome being a part of this film series. However, as we see once again at this COP, the majority of those given seats at decision-making tables are older people. And if we're being perfectly honest, still largely the case, it's men who take up some of the dominant places. We've made some progress, but children and young people are still largely excluded from shaping their own future. And this, after all, is the day 
for youth here at the COPS, so it's very appropriate we're having this conversation. And furthermore, we still have a long way to go in ensuring the voices of other marginalised groups are, uh, that they're represented at the conference like, uh, conference like this one. In our elders' mandate, Mandela instructed us to avoid becoming, and I quote, arrogant or arbitrary, and to ensure that we're focused on finding solutions to the shared global challenge that we face. These words would be well heeded, I believe, by governments here at this conference, this COP in Dubai. We must avoid the arbitrary or tokenistic inclusion of young people in climate forums and processes. People in powerful positions must be prepared to step aside to make space for children and youth. Why? Not because the children are our future, not because young people are the leaders of tomorrow, but because our children and young people are also the leaders of today. Young people already have the solutions to offer. The elders support initiatives such as the Climate Youth Negotiators Programme, which trains, connects, and empowers youth negotiators to participate meaningfully in the UN FLCCC processes and negotiations. And I've had great conversations with those young climate negotiators, with my colleague Zaid Al Hussein, as well as another elder. And uh, they've been really, really good because these are young, smart people, and we, we've encouraged them to take initiatives with their delegations, and they're prepared to do it. So I ask all of you here to check to see if your government is including young people in their COP28 negotiating teams. And if they're not, then urge them to do so in the future. I want to recount a final phrase from our mandate as elders. Nelson Mandela asked us as elders to, and I quote, support courage where there is fear, foster agreement where there is conflict, and inspire hope where there is despair. And I want to ask the same of all of you, of all of us in this room today. What is more, I want to ask this of our leaders, our heads of state and our governments. We mustn't delude ourselves. We face immense challenges in our world today, including the climate crisis. But we're not doomed yet. We have a precious window of opportunity to create the change we need. But we need to work together, we need to work quickly, and we need to, to combine the energies talents and insights of every generation. And you young people need to shake the elders, older people, and get them into crisis mode. Do you hear me? Crisis mode in dealing um, with the issues. And now I look forward um, very much to watching this film. Thank you. We are all global citizens. There's no gap between youth and adult. We actually have enough passion and we have the motivation. There is no more legitimate voice about the future than the people who are going to live in it. My name is Yolanda. I am, uh, I'm doing my PhD in climate change. Communication based in Australia. My name is Catherine and I'm a climate scientist. I would consider myself Changemaker, a sustainable activist, a young leader. I'm Mary Robinson, currently chair of the Elders, the group that Nelson Mandela brought together. I am an inventor and a United Nations Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals. My name is Fatih Birhul. I am the head of the International Energy Agency. I'm a climate advocate and a sustainability enthusiast. I am Dr. Vanessa Carey. I am the World Health Organization's Special Envoy for Climate Change and Health. I'm a gender and climate justice advocate from Brazil, and I'm really passionate about including intersectionality and climate justice into the negotiations and everything we do for a better future. It is great to meet you. Um, do you want to sort of tell us a little bit about your background and what you've been doing, particularly in the climate space? Growing up in a small island developing state, you know, in just in my lifetime alone, I've seen the impacts of climate change firsthand. So from a very young age, I've felt uh, compelled to be involved and be vocal about this. 
My background is in STEM. I'm a chemical and process engineer, but I try to work specifically on carbon abatement and decarbonization projects. Yeah, my latest project, Climate Words, it exists to increase climate literacy and to give people the tools they need to talk about climate. So we invite authors, scientists, indigenous leaders, policymakers, anyone who's an expert to define a word that is central to their work and define it in their own voice. As a UNICEF Youth Ambassador, I work to create an international children's rights and youth advocacy campaign that garnered over 450 million youth to take global online action uh, in pursuit of advocating for what they believe is the greatest challenge facing our generation. I am uh, the youngest to ever do a PhD um, in Samoa. Um, and in a way it does break a lot of barriers um, for and mindsets for other young people to to not just stop at a bachelor's or a master's like you can do a PhD and you can come back and work. I started a social enterprise called Sea Sustainable um, eight, seven to eight years ago and the idea was to galvanize community and youth to tackle uh, com conservation issues specifically marine conservation issues. I'm a scuba diver and diving in Southeast Asia I kind of realized that you know we do struggle with a lot of um, ocean related issues uh, like plastic pollution, um, coral bleaching, uh, fish bombing, um, lots of biodiversity issues. And for Sustainable, the purpose is really for us to look at how we can um, support coastal communities and especially the youth who may not be as privileged or have access to education, capability and knowledge in this region. I'm originally coming from North Macedonia, so inspired by the toxic air pollution in the capital city and the death of my aunt, I started a non-profit organization that helps people reduce CO2 emissions from day-to-day -day activities. After seven years of picking up plastic and picking up the data um, of like what we were collecting, we presented that to Congress in Peru and they then created a law to ban single-use plastic bags and single-use plastic straws. I saw how as young people, as civil society, we can work with the government and, and generate major change. I think it would be very interesting to hear your own direct experiences. Of, of climate change and its impacts. Because of, I mean, high temperatures and as well as low precipitation, um, agriculture is never, I mean, hasn't been very fruitful. And now this is actually forcing people to move from the rural areas to come into the open areas. But even risk their life through the Mediterranean Sea to get to the Europe's and the Americas. I have relatives who have traveled through the Mediterranean Sea and lost their lives. Every year, we had floods and occasionally we had hurricanes and this impacted our community especially the young kids that didn't have anything to eat so there was an increase of malnutrition that experience in my life has pushed me to work to face climate change because every year I see the impact in my communities and it's getting worse and worse. Living in a favela, the living conditions sometimes are very difficult. Recently, some of my relatives lost their homes in a landslide. Because of climate change, there are levels of rainfall that we have never seen before and droughts that are so long and, and the soil just can take it. And more and more I see this happening in Brazil, this happening with my community. I see so many people in my country this summer losing their homes from floods or losing their lives from uh, wildfires. And I think that adapting in, uh, in, this, in this whole new reality will be one of the greatest challenges. And uh, it's not only the, the practical stuff that we should take into account, it's also the, the mental um, burden that we have as a generation. Growing up, I used to wake up quite early to have to go to school. And I would see just, you know, just above the mountains, just a thick layer of smog during winter. It came to me that this is not just a natural occurrence. This is in fact also pollutants coming from the factories. That realization that the textile industry is polluting the environment that was maybe my catalyst in, into the environmental space. The climate crisis is a health crisis. It just doesn't get more fundamental than that. And health is how we feel and, and understand, I think, at a really personal level what the climate crisis is doing. 
And I think what people don't realize is that the way the climate crisis impacts the health crisis actually has an impact on other sectors, right? It's impacting whether, you know, if you get sick, it's a difference between whether your household lives above or below the poverty line. It has impacts on migration, on women and children who disproportionately suffer. And we know that countries that are already vulnerable and are the least contributing to climate change are those that are feeling the impacts the most currently. In all our communities as indigenous peoples, everyone has someone that lost their home. From the desert advancing, from the drought, from the floods, from the sea level rising, like, what are we waiting for? What, what do you see as the biggest barriers and obstacles to taking fast enough action on climate change? There are a lot of solutions are on the table, but a lot of times it takes so much time to create those decisions that when they come to being implemented, the time in which they are implemented really changes the way that it gets implemented. So I think if it's implemented at the right time, most of the solutions can turn out to be very, very successful. And even if not successful, you can really understand what went wrong because the situation in which the solution was built and it is implemented is the same. Seems to me that one of the biggest challenges we face is is, is what you might call a crisis of, of perception uh, across Western societies in particular, where, you know, over centuries, not even decades, you know, we've become progressively more distant from the natural world and we become increasingly uh, unaware of the extent to which our entire civilization depends upon healthy natural systems. A lot of times folks, especially as they, they come into positions of privilege, lose sight of these fundamental values of, you know, being empathetic, having moral values or a commitment to transparency, because they're often forced to prioritize their interests for the, their stakeholders or their financiers over their over essentially their constituents or the people on the planet. We will not solve the climate crisis unless we put people at the center, um, not just about uh, for our developmental policies within our countries or within our cities or within our villages, but also internationally, that we often have this dissociation between uh, high politics at an international level and fractious negotiations where we forget what are we even at the table for? And who are we claiming to represent? I do think governments should be held more accountable for their commitments. I think there should be greater transparency in their reporting and, um, and their targets, you know, their progress to these targets as well. Because, you know, for, for years, um, you know, 2015 and the Paris Agreement, that's a long time has passed since then what actual concrete action has been taken. If we really want to operate within a safe and just space, which we all collectively have a responsibility to move toward, then there will be, um, per necessity, a transition of, of access to carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, water, land, biodiversity, that has to be made more, uh, let's say, accessible for, for the vulnerable and poor, uh, while uh, the rich minority has to change behavior. In Mexico, we have a very huge um, a challenge. I don't see that the people, regular people on the street are aware of the climate crisis. It's very disturbing because um, the country is very, very um, a vulnerable to climate change. And um, so at the same time, people are not aware. We are not seeing any efforts to educate. I mean, it scares me sometimes that many of the people that are talking about equity and just transition do not seem to have a clue of that, you know, <laughs> what it means for people who, you know, are um, wrestling with poverty on a daily basis. We need people to change their behaviour uh, in all of the roles that they play. So in their homes, in their workplaces, in communities, we need people to do things differently to what they've been doing in the past. And we need more wider kind of social cultural change, actually. We need to change our relationship with, with things, with consumption and with the natural environment. Without fixing the problem in uh, the energy sector, we have no chance whatsoever to reach our climate goals. When governments tell us we should be turning off the lights, it ignores the fact that they're still funding new Fuel, uh, oil and gas projects, right? So um, I think um, where we see action on a 
larger scale um, and where structural um, barriers to individual existence are removed, I think that would be really helpful. A big part of our problems with uh, climate change have to do with you know, systemic problems uh, and corruption and uh, decisions that are made at the highest levels that prevent us from making the change that we need. I feel like young people always get that attribute that we're hopeful and that we're optimistic and you know that it's also kind of up to us to um, save us out of this climate emergency. I still feel afraid quite often because we see that no matter what action we take, it just doesn't seem to be enough. So I think there's an extraordinary opportunity to educate, to have people understand the, really the urgency of what we're facing and how our health is being impacted and what that is doing to undermine the fabric of our societies and our world to drive inequity and to really destabilize our future because we are fundamentally fighting for our survival right now. I'm currently going through uh, some form of training to become a negotiator and understanding this process. Um, and it's from my first encounter with it at the SBs, it's such a complicated process. And I guess my question is like, is the negotiation process currently effective? I have been uh, one of the few people to attend all 27 conferences of parties of the UN Framework Convention. And the short answer to your question is no, it's not effective. Uh, the longer answer is it's the only game we have. There is no alternative. There's no global president of planet Earth who can make decisions. There's 200 presidents and prime ministers who have to come together to make a global decision. COPs are huge mastodont uh, undertakings. At COP, every single country of the world needs to agree on a certain way forward before it's actually taken up in kind of the decision text of the COP. So understandably, that is extremely slow. But don't you think that all of this would go way faster if we wouldn't allow those huge companies to sponsor the COP? For many of the countries that are most affected by climate change, um, they don't have the financial capacities to, um, yeah, to protect themselves from the consequences of climate change. And this, once again, is connected to those huge corporations that exploit um, their resources and the people who work there. Every little bit of warming matters, and the COP process has been effective in starting to, beginning to, lower the threshold that we can limit warming to. But is the COP process sufficient? No, it is not sufficient. Why not? Because it doesn't involve many of the actors who have to make the decisions, especially large multinational corporations. The bulk of decisions has been taken at the multilateral level. Where the responsibility has now shifted is to governments to enact, implement those multilateral decisions at home. COP isn't binding. There's no, you know, we've seen some countries ratchet down their contributions as well as up and even those countries that um, say they're going to do more often don't actually do the things that they commit to at COP. In the initial COPs the entire focus of the civil society and all of us was on making sure that governments delivered and now the focus when I go to COPs is you know we're all in it we come there we do our own little things and governments get a free pass. What we need is a, a United Nations Security Council for climate change and biodiversity. And on that Security Council, yes, we need some leading countries and we need least developed countries represented, but we also need a, ta a seat at the table for the youth. We need a seat at the table for the indigenous people. If you can create a smaller group that is responsible to the bigger communities, we have a chance of succeeding. The loss and damage get adopted at the COP27, but the operationalizations must happen at the COP28. We are talking about the funding mechanism. 
We are still doing a blocks between developed countries because they think they are going to put the money in developing countries who say we wanted to be there. It is a shameful. This needs to be the COP of the just transition because we have to have a discussion about what the future is for these economies and where people will work. And if we can point to a more positive future without um, uh, petrostates having to use fossil fuels as the basis of that economy, then I think we could really make some progress at this COP. So I, I always go into COP feeling optimistic, but that's my note of optimism this year. How would you like to raise the profile of the work that uh, the youth of the world are capable of doing and pulling that youth movement together so that you can have the impact that is needed? Yes, I always um, try to emphasize capacity building because as young people, we cannot be able to um, achieve whatsoever we want to achieve um, in our fight against climate change if we are not on top of things. So we need to be giving that chance to be able to learn about climate change issues so that we are also able to help our communities to be resilient to climate change. Part of this fund, loss and damage, or also the, the developed nations, the rich nations should uh, start developing top level universities all over the world, uh, technological institutes that would really start forming doing capacity development of thousands of thousands of young students like yourself for really facing the climate uh, change challenges. Education is just seen as something very elitist, something for white people, something for rich people. The first time I had the opportunity to apply for a scholarship at a private school, I was 11 years old. I had to wake up at 4 a.m. every day to go to school. People would point at guns on my head. Uh, going through violent, very violent places to be able to get what other people, what for other people is just so simple. Listening to youth is not enough. Insights from the young leaders must be utilized to transform policies and programs. Without any tangible actions, you realize that youth may have few seats at the table, but those seats have no real meaning. It's important to have young people's voices in terms of helping set the ambition. But it's also really important to have young people's voices in the room where actions are being scrutinised as well. This isn't just about having people at the table. It's also about ensuring that we have that diverse selection of youth. So conducting surveys, ensuring that youth have a space to talk and ensuring that people actually have that follow up and follow through from our leaders where we see that the ideas that we want are actually implemented. We should have a lobby that pushes for more youth inclusion at all levels. If you're not in the table, you're part of the menu. If we think about year two, 2100, which is until when many of the projections um, are targeted, I won't see year 2100, but many people alive now, like young people, will. And since it's it's the, the future of, the, of young people, so I think it's essential that the young people also have a say in what happens. Young people, they've understood. They've, they've followed the knowledge, they recognize the facts and, and are much, much more in line with the state of evidence than, um, than my generation and an elder. I believe that uh, young voices need to be not only at the table, but officially and in numbers at the table um, as delegates, as participants whose voices matter. Given the diversity of young people and our ability to organize and collaborate across different geographies is a very powerful thing and it fosters a lot of new ideas and, and thinking and cross-learning. Young people, yes, will, will look at issues quite differently, in my experience. Uh, they will come up with new ideas and things that haven't been tried. But also, really importantly, they won't be kind of so jaded uh, and um, at the idea of trying something again that perhaps has tried in the past. My advice to young people is don't wait to be invited. Always be there to assert your own space. You have the wisdom, you have the perspective, you have the connectedness, and I think you have the passion. Uh, that will truly allow us to expose the cracks in the system. I have big hopes for, for the youth. What gives you hope to continue in this fight? 
What gives me hope is when I see people acting together. Representatives from all across civil society are all coming together to recognize that the climate crisis, to care about the climate crisis, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be an environmentalist, you don't have to be an activist, you only have to be a human being living on planet Earth. And if you're that, then you have everything that you need to care about this issue and to advocate for a better future for all of us. There is this international movement of indigenous peoples that for more than 100 years, we have been struggling to make our voice heard at the different international level. And now I see conservations organizations, environmentalist organizations, they are more open to really listen to our messages and join hands. If you have a look at some of what has been happening more recently, uh, I mean, look at the, the clean energy transition. I think there are estimates that by 2025, uh, there'll be more electricity globally produced from renewables than, than other sources. There are things happening. It's just a question of pace. But that is why it is really, really vitally important that uh, you and your generation continue to hold very vocally governments to account and business to account. So please keep doing what you're doing. One of the most powerful levers that young people have as they enter the workforce is to ask awkward questions of potential employers. Right. Because, and you never know, you never know when you're one, yours the one that just triggers the boardroom conversation and says, you know what, we had another brilliant young engineer turn us down this week and I think it's because we didn't have a good answer to the question what are you doing about climate change when I attended my first COP back in Paris it was for the Paris Agreement COP21 there were about 20 to 30 maximum uh, youth uh, from Brazil that attended in our delegation and nowadays the last COP COP27 in Egypt that we attended there was over three four hundred youth a lot of them were black youth uh, from peripheries of all over the world but including of course in Brazil in the favelas and also indigenous young people that are kind of reclaiming now their power into these spaces, accessing those spaces. So it gives me so much hope and strength to continue in this fight to see that these spaces are opening up, that people are willing to collaborate, that people understand the seriousness and the big challenge that we have as a community, as a planet. I think one thing that really gives me hope is the fact that young people, you know, aside from being activists, they are trying to engage in the boardrooms, they are scientists, they are entrepreneurs, they're really, you know, going across all of these different sectors and, and industries and working to create such impact within. And I think that's something that I, I try and learn from my peers all the time. I find hope in the actions of youth, that we are brave enough to take governments to task. There's so many interesting cases of climate litigation that have been youth-led this year. Youth groups taking governments to court, taking big polluters to court. And that is the inspiration that really keeps me going. This is the fact that there's nothing to be afraid of. There's only so much to gain, and we simply need to work together, learn from each other. From across regions, there's far more that unites us than that which divides us. Thank you.
Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for your rapt attention. Thank you so much to Mary for coming and um, talking so brilliantly at the start of this session. Um, I'd like to now invite three of the participants who took part in this year's film up to come and join our panel. So I think we have two participants over here. And hello over here, if you'd like to come and take a seat. Wonderful, thank you. So we're going to be joined in a second by Amy T, uh, Amy Thompson, who also helped produce and direct this film. Um, I'm going to start by asking each of our participants uh, to introduce themselves and just say a couple of words um, about what it is they're doing um, that caused us to invite them to take part in this film or to make them want to take part in this film. Uh, so we'll start from this end and then work down the row. Over to you. Thank you, Amy. So I'm Halal Hamawi. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at Nottingham Trent University. Uh, my focus is climate finance politics. Um, and I also um, work with Global Green Growth Institute as a climate finance senior associate. And the third hat I'm wearing today also as a climate activist, uh, where I launched an initiative to increase uh, awareness about climate change through social media. Um, so I think the this film is beyond what we presented today because the process we went through, the discussion we had with those uh, seniors and had like more than 10 years, uh, like Sonita who I interviewed had around 30 years of experience and she was there since 1992 and the Earth Summit. The discussion was about one hour and it was uh, beyond the scrap that we prepared. Um, it, may, it meant a lot to me and I believe as well to other young who participated. Um, yeah, this is that from my side. Okay, much better now. Hi, everyone. My name is Mudie Mafantiri. I'm an environmental scientist. I'm from Lesotho. I focus on the Just Transition Sustainable Development and the Green Economy. Um, at present, I work as a policy and research officer at the Climate Action Network South Africa. And I would really say the thing that inspired me to join, part of, to join and be part of this film is the fact that I'm from Lesotho, and that is a least developed country it's also a country in which our youth population is being stifled. We don't have enough of a loud voice. We don't have much of a presence, let alone um, at a global platform such as COP. And so I was really inspired to be in this film to sort of you know, be a part of changing that narrative because for far too long, we've been almost the forgotten country in Southern Africa. A lot of people think that we are in fact part of South Africa and that's not the case. And uh, there are stories to be told about how youth in Lesotho are being affected by climate change. There are also stories to be told about how we can, in fact, contribute to global solutions to address climate change. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I am Dauda Cham. I am from the Gambia. I'm in the west coast of Africa. Um, I am the deputy executive director of um, a youth-led NGO called the Household Disaster Resilience Project. Um, help Gambia, which focuses around environment and climate change issues. Um, but also I um, work with um, other organizations in the international space, I'm also a UNICEF Young Voice from the Sahel, um, where we talk about the problems that the Sahelian region of um, Africa is really faced with. Um, the Gambia, where I come from, is a low-lying country, and uh, it has been listed by the IPCC as one of the 100 most um, climate vulnerable countries and top 10 when it comes to um, sea level rise and coastal erosion. And this shows that our country is really at a high risk. In fact, our capital city, according to research, um, a one meter rise in sea level with, will um, inundate 8% of our country's land area. So all of these are 
um, the statistics that are really are there and this is what is really motivating me as a young people to speak up but also to um, mobilize young people because of previous speakers have said it here, young people are the ones that are least um, represented in these decision making um, um, tables. And if you look at it, we are the most affected uh, when it comes to these issues. So as a young person, I try to create that platform in my country to mobilize young people so that we can speak to power, but also to take part in policy making processes. It hasn't been easy, but with our push, we are able to make um, some positive um, um, successes. Yeah. Brilliant. And finally, I'd like to ask Amy to introduce herself as well, please. Hi, um, I'm Amy. Uh, and finally, I'm Amy Monroe Fall. Uh, I lead on education and student engagement work uh, as part of Cambridge Zero at the University of Cambridge. I'm really honoured to have such a wonderful panel here today. Um, there's a slight change from the advertised lineup. Uh, Brighton very sadly couldn't make it, and Hala um, has very kindly stepped into the breach to take part in this panel today, and we're delighted to have her. So I've got a question I'd like to ask all of you, and then we'll go to the audience uh, for some questions, then I've got a few more depending on how we go. So the first one kind of comes from today, and it's, part, it's to do with what this film is calling for, which is about inclusion of youth in party negotiations, in the negotiations of all parties. Um, and there was some really interesting research that was pre presented as part of the Dubai Youth Climate Dialogue this morning, looking at the different levels of inclusion in different parties, in different countries. Um, so what I wanted to ask is, what do you think, in your own countries, are the things that need to happen to enable that meaningful, non-tokenistic participation and inclusion for young people to take place within your own parties? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if anyone wants to put their hand up to go first, that would be great. Great. I think to start with, uh, we need to be in the same room as our parties. It's incredibly difficult, and I'm speaking from experience, to, to reach our negotiators. And this is you know, the first and most obvious challenge uh, from meaningful youth participation in these negotiations. The second thing is that we would definitely need to uh, be recognized as people who have valuable contributions to these negotiations so that we can get accreditation. Because one would think the biggest challenge to coming to such a conference as COP is, is funding. And fundamentally, it's not. You might find it's far more easier for someone to fund you. But the challenge is that you don't have accreditation. And it would be most helpful if our governments could you know, do what they can by giving that accreditation to youth that are qualified and to show some faith in youth. Because I see this, uh, you know, sort of an assumption, and this relates back to our cultural context, that we are not ready to make these contributions, uh, that we are not quite ready to be in the same room or sit at the same table. And these are the things that need to change. These are the social cultural things that need to change. Fantastic, my dear. Daughter? Yeah, um, thank you. So maybe I will just come in the positive side. Um, for the past um, years, um, it has really been difficult to have young people being part of our party delegation. But in the past two years, that is starting from the COP27, to um, our engagement as young people and the mobilization of ourselves. And this um, shows that when we mobilize ourselves and we are united, we are powerful. Uh, we mobilized ourselves and then ensured that we had what we call the local conference of youth. This was introduced to the country by myself because I've been in Yongo for the past four to five years. And I've seen that the Elkois have been taking place in other countries, but the Gambia has never had such, even though we are, um, I mean, facing or bearing the, um, the biggest brunt of climate change. So I decided that we bring the Elkois to the country. And through this Elkois, we were able to bring our government on board where the first ELCOI, that is a local conference of youth, uh, we brought the minister to, to also share uh, some highlights and also be part of our engagement. And during that conference, we've committed the minister to see how best they can work with young people so that we are part of these policy making processes that they do. And from that meeting, we were able to secure 10 badges uh, for um, delegates, even though we did not get funding from the ministry, but we were able to get badges and some of them got sponsors and others were able to sponsor themselves. And this year, when we were doing our Elkoi, we were able to secure um, about $5,000 from the government to sponsor our local conference of youth. Again, this shows that 
with um, some push, we can be able to have some positive um, um, results. And this year, I am part of our party delegates, as you could see. I have a party badge, and I've been following negotiations, um, even though I am not speaking, because it's my first time following negotiations, but I've been attached to one of our lead negotiators on finance, and also to, during one of our sessions um, in our pavilion, the Gambia Pavilion, this is the first time we've got a pavilion for the past um, years, we were, um, had a session on how best can we have um, a structured program of young negotiators, where young negotiators will be recruited so that those that are there, when they, uh, when they retire, there could be a succession plan that some of us who are also coming up could um, succeed them. And this is a commitment that the ministry has made. And once we are back, this is going to be one of the things that they will put in place. That is to have a structured program where young people like myself are going to be trained on climate negotiation. Thank you. Brilliant. Hala. Uh, if I want to speak about my country, Jordan, uh, I think since I started working on climate change, I've seen more inclusion to youth. Um, but still, I would say there is a need to systemize or like set a system how to include them. Like if there is selected number of youth would they speak on behalf of the rest, they need to understand what is the needs and priorities for everyone. Um, and of course, I agree uh, that coming here is not easy. Uh, finance to be part of decision making is not easy. Um, it is good that we are here. We're trying to contribute, whether like through the film or um, some of us are there in the negotiation. But I think that we are the ones that are mostly affected by the decision are being made today, and we are yet not really included in the decision. Um, so yeah, there is m more work needed, uh, but I see that the more we raise our voice that we need to be part of it, I think we will be heard at the end. Um, so our role is to keep pushing right now. Fantastic, thank you. So some common themes that seem to be running through there. Um, there's a need to be in the same room. There's a need for accreditation and access, basically. There's a need for um, what I'm going to write down as institutionalization, but systems to ensure that young people are part of that system from the very beginning. And there's maybe a need for some training about how to demystify the COP process and how to really engage so that that process of having to go through obs your observing negotiations daughter, that you can get to know that process much more quickly and that can be sped up. I'd like to throw this open to the audience for some questions now. I think there is a roving mic. So if you could put your hands up. Um, and we'll start just down at the front here. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, it was an amazing film, and thank you all for being here. I guess my question is, um, how can we work together as youth collectively outside of the negotiations to amplify, I guess, everybody's work so that when we get to negotiations, political will around the world is much further in what, I guess, what the negotiators are willing to push for, if that makes any sense. Fantastic, thank you. So this is, as I understand it, really thinking about how to work together outside the negotiations to amplify political will such that by the time we get to the negotiations themselves, the groundwork's already been done and the decisions become easier. Um, who'd like to take this to start off with? Um, so I'll give you an example that I worked on. So when I said, like, I launched an initiative last year at COP uh, where I found that there is a need to increase awareness about climate change in uh, my own language, which is Arabic, because not many people speak English, and, like, most of the negotiation, everything here is in, Eng in English. But really, like, the people that are more affected in vulnerable cities, they don't speak English. So uh, I decided to do this initiative, but I was like, I need like, I need to spread it around the Arab world. 
uh, where there is now 11 volunteers from different countries, from Arab countries, uh, are like creating content in Arabic, simple language, as well, not too technical, uh, about what is climate change, what as an individual we can do, um, what is COP, what is happening around the world as well. Uh, so this type of initiative that can be done um, on a regional level, sometimes on a local uh, on a local level, as well as a global. And definitely there is a lot of platforms, international platforms, where you can work with other youth on different like research, capacity building. So I think there is a lot of opportunity to collaborate. And you know, sometimes you just when you meet a person from another country, you decide to work with them on, you know, uh, writing a blog about climate change. So these little things matters a lot. Fantastic, thank you. Dada? Yeah, I think um, I would just want to answer this in, in respect to a training that we have done um, for the past uh, four to six months, I would say, as part of the International Youth Delegate Program. And that would be um, around um, finding your allies in this because when you go into the negotiation rooms, you have um, groups of people who have the same interests. Like the challenges that we are faced with in the Gambia, probably is similar to that of Senegal, Mali, and others, than um, compared to what the United States is facing. So you um, have to, in a way, um, be able to know who really you share the same problems or concerns with, form an ally with those people, and then you can have some concrete um, stands so that when you get into the negotiations, you are able to defend those um, 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 interests that you have. So um, that's what I'm gonna say uh, with regards to the question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I would say, uh, on top of, uh, is this working? Yeah. Um, what the panel have said is um, to talk about what you're doing and inspire other young people to take action. So all the people in this film started somewhere, and it might have been Inez behind you collecting rubbish from the beaches in Peru, or it could have been Pamela uh, who started up Climate Works. It starts somewhere, and if you can inspire someone else to actually take action and believe in themselves and their idea, then that's amazing. That's the beginning of their journey, and then that will grow and inspire others. Um, I just want to say I completely agree with everything that everybody has said. Uh, let's not uh, maybe underestimate the importance of local action because before we come to COP, I mean, we have to gather at a local level and there's so much strength in that because firstly, that is a place in which you are, one, familiar with, two, more, it, it might be more easy for you to relate to the people within your local area. So if you can join any sort of youth network, it doesn't have to be a global youth network such as Yango, but it could be, you know, a local, a local community. That is where you can start to maybe put together what your positions are, your priorities are, and then you can now advocate and also push for that at a local level. You can speak to your local governors and you start your action way ahead of COP. So that by the time you get here, you have something that you've established that you can stand on, that you can refer to. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna throw it back out for more questions. Uh, there's one down at the front here. Um, hi everyone. Um, so my question is to the youth that were in the video, Malahi, Dauda, I think that was you both. Um, what impact did it have on you to speak to climate leaders? Like, did you did it leave a lasting impression of with you? It's very rare that you get these opportunities to speak to such people. So I just wondered, yeah, what impression that left on you, if if at all. Thank you. And maybe just to remind the audience. Maybe just say who you spoke to before you answer. That would be really helpful. And Hala, do answer as well. If you'd like to go first. So I don't know if, I, if I've got in the question. If you prefer yeah. to So the question is, um, the opportunities to speak to these climate leaders are rare. So what did it mean to you to speak to somebody like that? What was the opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I was really excited to um, speak to um, Sir David um, King. Um, he really inspired me, um, knowing that he has been in this space for, I think, o over three decades. He has been in the climate negotiations. He has a traditional knowledge of these COP processes. 
and uh, he was able to share some of the challenges that they are faced with. And as a young person who um, as, is an activist, we are always hard on our governments that when they go into the negotiation rooms, they don't really fight for our interests also. But knowing the processes that are involved in this, uh, I, think, I mean, we have all seen in the video that sometimes it just um, take like one or two countries to, who, uh, to disagree on a point, and that would not be put into consensus until everyone agrees. So all of those things delay the process, and then I've been able to understand that our governments really, they try, and as much as they also, uh, also have some faults, and as young people, we would keep um, uh, putting them to account. But also, um, knowing what Sir David did um, for the past years, as a young person who is really interested in um, policy making processes, he inspires me, and I see myself getting to the level that he is, and even probably um, beyond that level. So that is a kind of an inspiration that I've gotten from him. And since then, um, I've reached out to him and I've been following some of the activities that he is doing on his um, social media. I'm very active on his page, that is his um, Twitter handle, and also his um, organization. So, um, yes, it has really been um, a great um, experience for me, and uh, I really learned a lot from him. Yeah. Wonderful. Really? It was really great to speak with Dr. Marina Kane uh, Cunningham. Um, honestly, it was such an honor. I was a tad nervous because I wasn't sure up until um, probably the last minute uh, who I was going to be in conversation with. And it was very inspiring to speak to someone who won champions for rural women and also speaks about indigenous knowledge and its importance. Sometimes as an environmental scientist, I know that sort of knowledge that is prioritized within the space itself. And so I understand that indigenous knowledge is very much low on the agenda. Perhaps people are only at the point where they can recognize it, but they don't necessarily consider it as a valid sort of knowledge. So it was very um, affirming to speak to someone who understands the importance of indigenous knowledge. Because when we're speaking about a future that is just and equitable, it's definitely one that is not as traditional or conservative in its um, ex acceptance of types of knowledge as the one that we're working with right now. So it helped me imagine a much more holistic future. Right. So what if, as an environmental scientist, I wasn't limited to the sort of data that is only in textbooks? What if I could actually consult with other indigenous uh, leaders? So um, as somebody who practices within the indigenous knowledge space locally, I really enjoyed that. And um, again, Dr. Mena is also somebody who is such a, a brilliant and active feminist. Um, I hope that in my old age, I'm someone who still has the passion for women in that way, because it's, it's so critical and it's so important to never lose sight of the, the people who are most vulnerable. Thank you. So basically I interviewed uh, Ms. Sunita Narain, who is the head of research center in India. And as I uh, mentioned before, um, she was there since 1992 uh, on the Air Summit, with, which made me like realized that I'm talking to a legacy in climate change. Uh, she was there when they were talking about setting the convention. So um, it meant a lot to me. Though we had the question, Amy sent it before, and I tried to put a script or like had points at least of what I'm gonna speak to her about. But then it was more of a conversation. Uh, taking her back to the time, as she said, taking her back 30 years when she was at my age. And for me, uh, trying to like imagine what it would be in 10, 20 years later. Um, our review was not really different about the negotiation. And as uh, Dr. Samuel Hawk may his soul rest in peace, say that there is no one hero to lead the negotiation. Um, so it's really hard if we, me and you sit down now trying to write one sentence, probably we can, we would spend one hour to agree on the sentence uh, we want. So how about more than 200 persons trying to agree on you know, not one sentence, articles. It's really hard, it's not easy. 
But yeah, as they describe it, it's not effective. And when I say from my point of view, it's not effective, I look specifically at the climate finance, which is really disappointing for me. And still in this cup, it is still disappointing because we hear numbers, we don't understand who gonna take, like who gonna benefit from those numbers, on what basis they're gonna be distributed, and what is the like to what country is like what regions. Uh, so yeah, this is my answer. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to move swiftly on because I know there's a couple more questions out there and I'd like to get through as many as we can. Um, so I think there was a gentleman back there and then after that we'll come to Inez for her question as well. But we'll answer this question first. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Kwaile Munaheng. Um, and Moody and I actually come from the same country, we're also in the same organization, Climate Action Network. Um, and I think she touched on quite a very important point there about um, what it means for youth to navigate, uh, to be agile um, in places that are designed um, not for us, um, in the least developed world at least. Um, I think my question is sort of how do you sort of recover from that and what sort of advice would you give to other young people to be resilient um, and sort of still, you know, um, apply for these opportunities because internationally you're, you're marveled at and you do such great work, but locally you're silenced by design at the same time where you have to build your own organization or you have to sort of um, find other ways besides, you know, where you actually have to support yourself. So how do you, how do you cope with that? How do you sort of deal with that, knowing that this is probably amazing here, but it'll probably not even make it its way back home? So, yeah, that's something I was sort of wanting to find out. Wonderful question. So just in my interpretation of what you've just said, so what it means for youth to be agile in spaces that are not necessarily designed for them, uh, how do you build resilience, how do you navigate these spaces, and how do you make that impact travel home as well? Who'd like to jump in on this? Mwere? Oh, you can. Okay. Thank you for that question, Kwaile. Uh, it's a very important question and something that I'm grappling with currently. And to be honest with you, my first line of defense really is probably a sense of community. So while I know that the context locally at home might not be as accommodating, I am part of uh, communities here. Um, that are very welcoming. And these are people that I can lean on for support. Um, these are people that I can consult with for better strategies because to be quite honest with you, as a youth advocate, I understand that if I have a goal to achieve, if I can't get through it straight, I need to go around. And that means that I'm going to have to go the, I'm going to have to take a lot more time. And I'm quite prepared to do that. And it's just a matter of figuring out how exactly do we go around these systems? Like you mentioned, they are hostile and they're not built for us. How do we go around those systems? Um, and not losing the energy, not losing the hope, not losing the faith. It's a matter of pacing oneself. Um, I do have a plan. I plan to execute it. It might take longer than, than usual. Um, it's been really inspiring to hear how Dada's journey has been quite nice, really. That you, know, you can just reach out to your government and they can support you in that way. Uh, however, we were both in a negotiations training, so you know that there are many ways to achieve a goal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, what I would just say is that um, uh, opportunities are out there. They may be scarce at some point, but nobody would bring the opportunities to your doorstep. You have to move from your convert zone to seek for those opportunities. And I think this has been the driving force for me as a young person since I started this whole thing. And in this um, fight against climate change, as young people, I think one thing that we really need to uh, keep our mind to is that we should be ready to educate ourselves because we cannot go out there to t talk to people about climate change issues or how they can um, protect themselves and their environment when we don't really know um, some of these things. So we should be ready to educate ourselves. But also, um, the necessity for us to have movements. I mean, united, we are powerful. And for me, uh, what has really been uh, working for me is uh, my ability to bring people together to be able to push for what we really wanted. Uh, what we are able to achieve today as young people from my country, uh, to have a party, but it was really difficult for those that were there before us. 
but we united ourselves and then we reach out to the people that are in power that we know it is only through them that we can get those things. So as young people, we really need to be able to, uh, we, really need to uh, we really need to be ready to educate ourselves, but also to form movements so that we are able to um, um, get greater impact or make greater impact, yeah. Wonderful. Hala, would you like to add anything? <laughs> that time, and I know I've got one more question from Inez, but briefly coming, summarizing some of the things that you've said, it really seems to be about people. It's about a sense of community. It's about willing to be really open-minded about how you go around things rather than going through them and using that community to keep you strong and to keep you driving through and going out to the world rather than waiting for it to come to you. Amy, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, if I can just add, um, I think that you guys, the work that you're doing is absolutely phenomenal. You are like helping future generations that their pathways will hopefully be easier. But I think what really needs to change, going back to your question, is not what youth do, but what how can the processes be more accessible to young people? And that's what has to change as well. Um, and I think the work that you're doing and showcasing how brilliantly you're um, engaging in these formal processes and what you're doing from your community level to the national to the international level is really helping to make the futures better for young people. And let's just hope that formally you are able to participate in um, COMA negotiations very soon. Wonderful. Um, could we go to Inez for her question? Thank you. Um, it's been great to see the work that you've done uh, come to the screen. And to answer a question earlier about what it felt like um, to speak to Christiana Figueres, it was like we're in this together, right? But it was mentioned also in the film that we are a small group. And I think all of us here agree that climate change is a huge issue that we should try and help solve. But my question to you is, how do we get to those who aren't yet at that point? And there are many leaders, all the leaders we spoke to agree with us. And so that's why it was a great space to converse and talk. Um, and of course, we have challenges in communication with those leaders, but there is some way in between getting to the point we're at as well. But there are many leaders who aren't and who it's harder to get to and many young people who aren't as well in this climate space. So how would you suggest uh, that we reach out to them? I think the film is a great way to do that, but are there other ways as well? Brilliant, so how do we reach out to those people, both leaders and maybe young people and maybe people more broadly who aren't already engaged with this and aren't already fighting to change it? Who'd like to put their hand up for it? Yeah, what do? <laughs> Keep having this conversation. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll speak on the part of how to, how to reach youth because this is something which I've been involved in. And much like you, it's, it's, it, I gained this experience because there was a question of, okay, at, at these events, at these conferences, at various actions, you're looking at the same faces, the same people, the same demographics. And it's a matter of making the intentional decision to go out and reach people physically where they are and not expecting them to come to you. And that means that you need to broaden the scope of your work, really, because I know this, having worked in an organization uh, that focuses a lot on building movements, we can be quite limited in our thinking and our reach, but it's a matter of connecting with other people as well, other organizations, and doing things differently. So if we are used to perhaps only hosting things online, um, I know that the Climate Action Network does really well with this, which is that there, is, uh, there was a trend that was noticed that there's not a lot of online participation and the barrier to participation was actually access to internet. And all we needed to do was purchase the data so that people can join these meetings. You know? And that is a, an example of meeting people where they are, right? So offering data support so that people can join and then learn more about climate action and different things that are being done in the communities and having to perhaps translate complex uh, policy to people to make it quite clear that actually this is an issue that affects you because sometimes people aren't aware, right? Like you mentioned, they, they are not in the space because they don't know that they're in fact affected. And at times the way in which climate change is communicated, it seems like a distant and a, a large thing that is far from people, far from the local context. And you need to make the, the effort to localize that context. So yeah, big focus on climate education and bridging that digital divide amongst, amongst other access issues. Also transport support. Uh, I did host an Elcoy South Africa this year with the support of very many generous organizations. 
and we were big on making the whole thing far more accessible. And that included giving transport support to people who were not maybe vocal at first that actually they cannot come to conferences because they don't have the transport locally. It's very hard for people who don't have financial means to admit to that, but uh, you know, opening that, that communication channel helps a lot. Yeah. So it's just fundamentally being considerate, yeah, and thinking differently. Um, yeah, so in terms of access uh, uh, for people, uh, I think CS mentioned one of the powerful tools is social media. It's really easy um, to get people together on social media. But I think for me, in terms of access, getting access to those that are out there, that is the leaders who are making the policies or the actions, uh, what really worked out for me is, um, to, in my organization, what we do is, whenever we do activities, if at the end of the year, when we have our um, report and so on, we don't wait for our ministries to ask for the reports also. What we do is we go to them to communicate to them what we do. So that way they are aware of what you do. And this has really made it easier for me to get co connected to some of these people because they know that, okay, this person is not only doing this because some of them, they are out there in their offices. They don't know what is really happening in the ground. So it is us that have that direct contact with the communities and we are the ones who really know what those communities are facing. So yes, I mean, as young people, in as much as we are fighting for change and all of that, we really need to go like I said, move out from our comfort zone to go look out for those opportunities that are out there, but also to get to where these decision making people, uh, um, where those that make decision are, 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 that is in their offices, reach out to them, explain to them the things that we are doing and what you really want. Because um, sometimes um, I have this problem with young people. We argue um, a lot, we make a lot of, uh, uh, say a lot of stuff, but sometimes we are not really constructive in what we do. So how best do we engage the people that we think, okay, these are the people that are making this decision. It doesn't always have to be, um, we have to be harsh on them all the time, but engage them because you, what you need as, 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 as activists is to ensure that they are on your side because these are the people who implement these policies. All you can do is, you have an advocacy role. All we do is, most of the times, is talk, you know, we do actions and so on. But at the end of the day, the implementation of the policies and the programs are solely done by those people who are in power. So if you don't have them on your side, then that becomes a challenge. So go out to them, I mean, communicate to them the things that you do so that they are able to understand what you do and then you can be easily um, able to um, get them do what you really want them to do, yeah. Uh, well, uh, one thing I would uh, talk uh, based on experience that uh, especially those who doesn't have accessibility to any resources, um, so referral or what we call the snowball, like, you know, someone would tell someone is a way to, you know, get that information spread. Another thing that I mentioned earlier, we have language barrier in many regions. So accessibility in different language is really important. Um, uh, the third thing, which is, I think to some extent nowadays is important, is social media. We use social media for many things, but it is important to like, you know, if, in matter if we're talking about awareness, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, advocacy, social media, I think it's also a platform to use. Um, yeah, that's it. Wonderful, Amy. Um, I think just to add, if you, if you go back to COP26, when youth engagement was really kind of started happening, um, and uh, that, that was, that's where it kind of really started to galvanize. And then you look at what happened in COP27, and there was the youth pavilion, and it was like people were starting to take more notice. And then you look at this COP, and it's the largest youth delegation of any COP. And this morning I was at the um, Youth um, Climate Summit, um, and it was absolutely brilliant. There were so many presentations from young people who were so articulate and held that space and were just like, did, did such a good service to the young people you represent. Um, and I think just keep going. And the, the, I can't remember the exact phrase, but the phrase that the young people kept saying is to climate leaders is we, so the negotiators, 
we trust you to take action. It's not, it's slightly wrong, I've misremembered it, but it was along those lines. And I think that's an absolutely brilliant and very powerful strap line, because at some point you can switch it to we don't trust you. So if you keep going to these negotiations, keep doing the work that you're doing, it will galvanize and you will start to bring more people on board because they will see the impact you're having and the amazing work that you're doing. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to wrap up the Q&A there, but just to finish off in a final couple of minutes, I just wanted to pull out a few themes that sort of seem to really arise both in the film, from Mary's comments and from some of the things that you said. And I wanted to focus briefly on four things. The first one being the role of kindness and community. The second one being listening and going to people where they are. The third being courage to challenge with new ways of thinking. And the fourth one being hope in action. Not just hope for hope's sake, but hope in action. So to briefly run through those kindness and community I was really struck by the way in which all of you picked up especially on the point around spaces that aren't designed for you the role of community and upholding each other and I think there's a really fundamental thing here about compassion for each other in the most radical sense compassion for ourselves but compassion for everyone in the world who's going to live through these challenges collectively um, I think that some of the things that you said brought that out really really beautifully but also the necessity of that in order to drive this action in order for these communities to be galvanized the second piece is about listening. We talk about listening all the time. It comes out everywhere. We're thinking about really meaningful youth engagement, any meaningful engagement, honestly, but specifically with youth engagement. And again, I was really struck by the theme of, especially when you're engaging with people who aren't already engaged, going to people where they are, understanding what their access issues are, whether it be data, transport, language, really minimizing those barriers to be able to have that level of connection and enable people to engage. Thirdly, the courage to challenge with new ways of thinking or even to pick up ways of thinking that have been explored before and discarded for whatever reason because they, were too, they felt too hard or it wasn't the right political moment. And the amazing role that young people and all three of you who are sitting here and others who are in the audience and all those who are in the film have to really drive that and to have the passion and the energy and the <laughs> drive to push that forward and to have the courage to challenge. I think that was something that came out really strongly in some of the things that Mary said. It's particularly topical for her in the last 10 days, but having that courage to challenge convention. And then finally, the importance of hope. And as I said, not hope in a generic sense, but hope in action. Hope in having young people whose futures are going to be defined by these environmental challenges sitting at the table. It's so clear that all of these young people here are credible, capable, and are able and should have a place at these tables to actually make these decisions and to drive that forwards both at COP and at home within their own countries as well. Um, thank you very much for listening. A huge thank you to our panellists um, this afternoon. You've been absolutely wonderful for, by taking part in the film and today. And thank you to our audience for all the questions. I'll stop there. Brilliant. We're going to do a quick photo of these guys, but everyone feel free to go on with your afternoons. Yeah. Um, could anyone else who is involved in the film who's here come down and we'll take your photo too?